I'm so reminded as we were praising together the incredible thought of Galatians 2.20 that Jesus came and he so loved us that he gave himself for us and he has given himself to us and he indwells within us. And as we were praising, <coughs> excuse me, I was reminded of a time when I heard someone say that one of the great theologians was asked, what is the deepest and the greatest theological truth that you know? And people were expecting just all kinds of answers that it could be. And he simply said, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And what a wonderful expression. It's depth, it's height, it's breadth. Uh, we can never really be able to plumb the fullness of the depth of the love of God, and we'll be celebrating that love as we close out this morning. But before we do celebrate the Lord and His table, uh, we are going to have to say goodbye. Goodbye to three of my newest and best friends, Boaz, Ruth, and Naomi. And I have uh, so uh, just grown in my own self in this incredible study and today we're just going to climactically end it and sort of pull it together in some really powerful ways and applicable ways which lead us up to the celebration of, of the Lord Jesus Christ for us today. As we get started again I just wanted to uh, start with the word uh, genealogy. We all are really familiar with that word and the meaning and the, the tracing of our family lines or family trees, our, our lineage, uh, the generations before us, generations behind us, or uh, ancestry. I know Ancestry.com has become a huge a presence on the internet and people, and several years ago, we actually gave Pam uh, that as a gift for her to actually uh, trace some of her people and we did it through the DNA thing that they do and it was just so enlightening and so many incredible things we saw through that. Uh, my <clears throat> mother, when she was alive, she gave me this one year. It's called the World Book of Kenleys. <laughs> and, um, it actually starts out, it has just a whole lot of information about ancestry and genealogy that's just uh, general. But then there's some real specifics about our family and where they kind of traced us to and we came from and a lot of incredible thoughts. And it was really interesting, you guys, because I was, I was really interested in, in this years and years ago. And I would go to visit in a assisted living facility to see my aunt, uh, my aunt Janice. And Aunt Janice knew and I would always ask her questions about my grandfather who died when they were young and my grandmother who I never knew on the Kenley side and different things. And so one time when I showed up, she had this handwritten, you can see, thing, and this goes all the way back to maybe the early 90s, and she just kept writing. And she has Michael Loring Kenley on the top, and then she starts with my parents and my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. It was interesting that uh, several Kenleys came through Baltimore a few times came and visited and then left. I don't know why they left, but I don't know. But they came back and um, she wrote in there that <clears throat> the one that did that was a very, very good businessman. And she said in there, if he would have stayed in one place, he probably would have been very wealthy. So I don't know what all that meant. But it was really interesting and she sort of told me where uh, certain and people are buried up in Blacksburg. And so it was, it's really incredible. And I'm just so thankful uh, to her because she was always, my Janice was really family oriented. She was kind of the hub that was always keeping my father and our family together. And I think that's probably why it struck me. 
And then in 2004, a friend of mine gave me this. It's called The Ancestry of Michael Loring Kenley. And it was interesting. He put here, Charlie, you'd appreciate this. He wrote at the bottom, an incomplete work until traced to Adam. <laughs> so, so it goes back and it was it, it, very, very incredible. A lot more detail here. <clears throat> I told Gary Settle one time, actually there is a Settle somewhere in my lineage uh, from Virginia. So, but uh, two, and I don't know, they're my obviously great, great, great somethings, uh, fought in the Civil War and one of them was taken captive in Gettysburg, isn't that incredible, in the battle, and was taken prisoner and ended up uh, in the prison. The one that's in the bay, what's in the bay? Um, the prison that was on, on the water there. What is it? Yeah, it, I don't know, I can't remember what it was or. No, it's not in Delaware, because when, when I went on a cruise, I saw it, and a lot of guys died there, a lot of Confederates. I don't remember. I don't know, it's in here somewhere, but... Uh, <laughs> he was on the Confederate side. And then, and then one was even taken down to... It, they were using them as human shields down at Sumter near the end of the war. A lot of the prisoners were taken there and actually survived that, which a lot of men didn't. So, well, now you know everything about me. So, um, but well, what I want to do is today is, is I really wanted us just to, to take what would seemingly almost be just like an addendum. I really wanted us to, to examine this absolutely incredible last part of the book of Ruth. Ruth 4, uh, verses 18 to 22. Uh, they're timeless. A major topic here is genealogy, past and future, and an awful lot of applicable things we can learn. So I want to encourage you, if you would, with that introduction, to turn in the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures. And one final time, I would say, to the book of Ruth. And we are going to continue and conclude our considerations of the book of Ruth and the climactic proclamation that we are entitling Ruth, her redemption. And we will be starting in verse 18 this morning, but as always, we just ask God's richest blessing. We really want the illumination of the Holy Spirit, which we desperately need on the divine revelation of the Word of God, authoritative, absolute, inerrant, and how important that is for us today as we've talked about. And as we interpret it literally and grammatically, historically, contextually, it really does lead us to a life-transforming application through the person of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit into increasing Christ's conformity. And that really always is my prayer is that we're just going to be edified as we gather uh, together. So what we've seen so far, and just a real quick touch on this incredible book, is we saw the overview of the entire book to start. Chapter 1, we called it the setting. Chapter 2, we called it her story. And then chapter 3, we called it her request. And that has led us up to where we are today. And where we are is her redemption, and we will finish out in this powerful, powerful way as we, we close out. We're making four pastor's expository observations in this chapter. The first one is the opportunity, uh, incredible uh, opportunity set before Boaz there. And then that led us to the right received, where he does receive that redemptive right. And then that moves us to the reward, which we talked about last week. And it was a marriage, Boaz to Ruth, and a family, a son, Obed. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here. Uh, the first is the marriage union of Boaz and Ruth, and we talked about that how vitally important marriage and being one of the divine institutions that God has really established to protect and preserve. 
but also God-given conception. And that was crucially important, the family. And we talked about that, the birth of a son. His name was Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then I love this. I didn't want us to miss this, the, the praising and rejoicing uh, in the Lord and of the Lord. That could be easily missed, but that was so incredible. His gracious blessing is acknowledged. And also we had celebrating with Bo Ruth and Boaz as well as Naomi in this incredible story where it begins and all the heartache to then just the fulfillment and the satisfaction. It's just incredible. And little would they have known as they started out aware they were going to sovereignly, providentially uh, be led. That leads us to this morning. We're going to call it the genealogy from uh, verses 18 to 22, our fourth and final observation. And you can follow along as I read. Now, this is a genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begot Amenadab. Amenadab begot Nation, and Nation begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. What an incredible way, in one sense, to sort of end this book. And at first glance, we may just kind of want to peruse right over it. But this relevant, timely, historically important book ends with this genealogy. This is the final act, we could say, or scene. In one sense, it's an epilogue to this book. I just wanted to give us a couple of thoughts by way of overview, and then we'll just dive into a, a few thoughts that are embedded here that are very important. This really is all about uh, genealogy, ancestry, or family tree, as you see behind me. It covers nine centuries. Uh, Perez was 1885 B.C., and it goes to David in 1040 B.C. There's 10 generations that are embedded here, and I think that's important uh, as that sort of unfolds. It goes from Perez to Nashon, and that really embraces the time of the patriarchs to the exodus and the wandering in the wilderness. So Moses was obviously a key player in that time. Salmon to David really embodies the time of Joshua entering into the promised land to the judges, which is when we see this depiction in Ruth occurring, and it really carries us to the, the monarchy, which began with King Saul, but leads us to King David. And one really important thought here, that this information was establishing the legal, rightful place for David to be king of Israel. That was very, very important. So this was crucially, crucially important. Look at verse 18 again. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, these are the family records of Perez. And this genealogy begins by looking uh, backwards, if you would, to Perez, who we mentioned in verse 12 of Ruth chapter 4. And genealogically and significantly, Perez was the son of Judah through Tamar. Uh, we've talked about Jesus being the lion of the tribe, what? Of Judah. So see, this is so significantly important because this line is going to go from David and we're going to see it lead up to the Lord Jesus Christ. I liked what Dr. John MacArthur said here. He said, although this genealogy only goes back to Perez, it conclusively establishes that David's lineage extends further back through Judah and Isaac to Abraham. So really crucially important information, and particularly in that time. Verse 18 continues and says, Perez begot Hezron. And when we come across the begotten and begotten and whatever else there is, it's just fathered. So that's what we're 
following along here. And Hezron is referenced in Genesis 46, 12. And he was among the family of Jacob that went out of Egypt. So you can see these links are crucially, crucially important. Verse 19 then moves and says, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amenadab. Ram is mentioned in 1 Chronicles 2.9. As there's an explanation there, we have several of these crucial, crucial genealogies. And Amenadab was the father-in-law of Aaron from Exodus 6.23. And as you know, Aaron was Moses' brother. And Amenadab is mentioned again in Matthew 1.4 and Luke 3.33. Uh, pretty amazing. Then we move to verse 20. Amenadab begot nation. And significantly revealed here is that uh, he is the head of the house or the leader of Judah. And that's referenced throughout Numbers. Numbers chapter 1 has a reference to 7 and 10. And I guess one of the things that struck me as I was reading this year, uh, you know, we kind of get into numbers and you're just kind of reading and you're like, oh, man, you know. And, but one of the things I try to do is to think, you know, this was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so all these people must be important. So I try to not just skip over them, but read them. And so vitally important in establishing David and the rightful reign of Christ was all important. So next time you come to the book of Numbers, uh, just be encouraged that uh, there's a lot of important information uh, there. Verse 20 continues, And Nashon begot Salmon, and uh, Salmon is the husband of the prostitute or harlot or Rahab, and so gracefully referenced in Matthew uh, 1, 5. And I just wanted to uh, make mention here of these women. And we'll kind of fast forward just to here, and I'll read it a little bit later. But in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have Tamar, we have Rahab, we have Ruth, and we have who is referenced as Uriah's wife, which is Bathsheba. I wanted to read something that this week... I was with Rachel Seaman, and we were planning a gathering at some point in the beginning of 2021 to celebrate Christ and center upon him sort of a, a, a post-Christmas sort of celebration, and part of that is embedded in Matthew 1 and 2. Rachel had written these, and it was better than I could even say it, and it was so encouraging to me, and I would hope it would be for you as well. In the light of God's grace and mercy... Four women are named in the line of Christ, and that demonstrates for us the potential for every life. Isn't that great? And every ugly situation to be used by God for good according to His purpose. Doesn't that hearten us as we really think about that and things just seem to be kind of unfolding and just unraveling all around us? And then this is what she put. Uh, Tamar was not an Israelite and had a scandalous story of deception. Rahab was not an Israelite and had a scandalous history of prostitution. Ruth's story was not so much like that, but she also was not an Israelite, and we have just spoken so highly of her and her character. But Bathsheba... Uh, her scandalous story was connected to uh, this incredible king, King David, but his adultery, his deception, and his murder. And when you think that this is all included in the line of Christ, you know, the only thing that can come to my mind? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Can you join me in that? That is just incredible amazing grace and we will never plumb the depths of it and I don't know about you guys but even standing before you today it gives me really cold chills to think that that's in his line and by grace through faith we are heirs he we are joined together with him 
He is working in us and willing and doing through us. And no matter what our past may be, it may have been that horrible past of the Apostle Paul. I love to use that as an illustration. Because people will say to me, Pastor Mike, God just can't work through me because of this and that and how bad this and that was. And I always like to go to Paul and think, well, look at the Apostle Paul, a murderer and one who would say, yeah, in the light of that, I'm going to forget what's behind. I'm going to press on. I'm going to grow in my knowledge of Christ, becoming like him and allowing him to work in me and through me to do what I couldn't do in and of myself. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that a great foundation to build a life upon? You know what? With us that's in this room today or anybody that can hear us, your story's not over. It is still being penned by the hand of God, whether it's seen or unseen. And when this incredible story started, it just looked so bleak, didn't it? With bitterness, and then look how it ends, with blessedness. But it was the, the hand of God working and willing and doing. Oh, be encouraged today. God has incredible plans for us, for hope and for joy, for the advancement of the church, for preparation. I don't know what they all are, but I know it causes me to be encouraged in the midst of these dark days that we, we live in. We move from those incredible thoughts to where it says Selman begot Boaz. It starts to zero in on where we're going Salmon is Boaz's father, and in transitioning, what he begins to do is to move now from the past generations, and he moves to the present, speaking of Boaz. And there's several generations that are selectively omitted here. They can be found in other places in the scriptures that keep the line going, but uh, they aren't included here. But if Boaz, as we think about uh, Salmon, if Boaz is any reflection of his dad, Salmon must have been an incredible godly man, correct? He must have been a great trainer of his children, and in particular Boaz. You know, the apple really, they say, doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? And it really just calls to us the important role that God's called us to as, as moms, as dads, as grandparents, as uncles, as aunts, as new creations in Christ that maybe doesn't have children, but that maybe we're uh, ministering in Awana, maybe in our neighborhood, maybe uh, we could go on, what it is. But it really, I just thought, and I've often thought about Joseph um, and his father, how he must have been because God entrusting the raising of Jesus to Joseph. I wonder what his grandfather was like. Uh, sometimes these folks are just kind of lost, but you know what? They're vitally important. And you're vitally important. And your family and those with you we continue in verse 21, and Boaz begot Obed. And Obed is the one that we're kind of centering here. His name means servant of God, a worshiper. And he is Boaz and Ruth's son. A gift. A gift from God. And he's Naomi's grandson. And David's grandfather. And how Naomi had to have just held this child, as we said last week. And then in verse 22, Obed begot Jesse. And Obed is Jesse's father. So as we're beginning to move towards David, it just sort of intensifies. And the training and the understanding. And then uh, verse 22 closes out. And Jesse begot David. And David is uh, Jesse's son. I just love and how Zeek has so encouraged me over the years that when um, 
Samuel was looking to anoint that next king. Uh, Jesse just thought it's got to be one of these other 11 sons. And maybe they were strong and they were this and they were that. And they brought them all before Samuel. And Samuel says, no, none of these are the one. Do you have anybody else? Oh, yeah, this one that was overlooked. He's out taking care of the sheep. Bring him. And then Samuel sees him and it says, aha, it's him. How amazing. And that's what we are to God. We are those ones that, aha, I want to work through Buck. Or, Dave, I'm going to utilize and work strongly through you. Or Brian Holbrook. And what an amazing thing for us to consider. And yeah, there's a lot of trials and tribulations and some speed bumps along the way, right? It seems like we're on just one big speed bump right now. But God has a plan. And I just kept thinking about Naomi and her bitterness and her brokenheartedness. Just think if she could have looked around the corner and saw what was coming. But she was just being called upon to live by faith. You guys, it's the same way in our life. I don't know exactly what might be going on for you individually. Some might do. You know, but if we just see around the corner, he's just asking us right now, Jim, just trust me. The price of lumber is going to go down. <laughs> just trust me. Just believe. It may not be exactly what you want right now. Don't lean to your own understanding. But trust me. I've got a plan, and my plan's way better than your plan. That sometimes is kind of hard, isn't it? Just opening up our hands. That's the beauty of open hands. Open hands just signify Lord. And just open up. And I love this incredible revelation here because that's what happened. And as you depart today, I just would want to encourage you. Maybe stop by that incredible uh, lineage that's back there from Adam to Christ. And I tried to highlight better where Obed and Ruth and them, they're kind of like in the middle. But also on the table next to it is just a tracing from, from David and Obed down to the person of Christ, a real good rendering of it, colorful one that's in the um, Holman Christian Standard Bible. But just sort of be amazed at God's sovereignty at God's providence, at his perfection, at every little juncture historically for a big spiritual purpose, our redemption through Jesus Christ. And King David, just as we would move into our concluding thoughts here, um, really looking back from Ruth, from a New Testament perspective, um, Dr. MacArthur said that latent messianic implications become so much more apparent. We have that privilege of, of looking back uh, to it. The fruit which is promised later on in the Davidic line finds its seedbed here. And I love this word. The hope of a messianic king and kingdom will be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ through the lineage of David's grandfather, Obed, who was born to Boaz and Ruth, the Moabitess. Amazing to consider. Tony Evans uh, says this about Obed as we move here. Obed would be grandfather to David, the great king of Israel. The ancient Israelites to whom the author was writing knew this amazing heritage. This they knew. But what they didn't know was what there, that there was an even greater descendant to come from this bloodline. The kingly line of David would ultimately lead to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would be born in his ancestral home of Bethlehem. Just incredible, incredible thoughts. And as I originally read this book and looked at that, I thought, why would it close this way? 
but I think in a lot of ways it just brings it all together in a perfect uh, conclusion. So as we begin to wrap up, as we do each week, a revelation from God from Ruth 4, 18 to, to 22. What's here? What's our information or our instruction? I don't want us to miss, and for one final time, see the Lord. See the Lord himself completing this season of his story. His predetermined, providential, sovereign, and perfect will. His plan for men, for their good, and ultimately for his glory. It's amazing, isn't it? This is a part, you guys, of our story. Because it's a part of the story of Christ and us being integrated with him and his selfless sacrifice on the cross for us. So it just should heighten us with praise and thanksgiving uh, to God. And the faithful, truthful, accurate genealogical record that we have here from Perez to David, it's affirmed, it's confirmed. We mentioned in 1 Chronicles 2, but also Matthew 1 and also in Luke 3. And that leads us to just a couple final thoughts. Through the indwelling life of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, how do we respond? How do we live by faith? What difference does any of this really make going through this, this whole study of this book for us to come and, and invest a little over an hour of our life here? What living lessons or, as I told you, what, that when I left the doctor's office, it was, is, what was I to do? And I just wanted to give us, and I will in, Brace some thoughts from uh, earlier as well here, but um, a couple of things here. The first thing is to recognize this. God is sovereign. God is working all things out according to his perfect providential plan or benefit for his pleasure and glory. Like Naomi and Ruth, we may not physically see it, but do we believe it? In the Santa Claus movie with Tim Allen, the child says that seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. And if we believe by faith, the eyes of our understanding are opened and we can see. And we can see God working and willing and doing. And that is so important for us in so many different ways and so many different dimensions. Trusting in the Lord with all our heart and not leaning to our own understanding. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says it this way, and I wanted to read this because it just really puts an exclamation point on. It's... And, just really grasp this, you guys. The seemingly ordinary events in the book of Ruth, travels, marriages, deaths, harvesting, eating, sleeping, purchasing land, revealed the guiding activities of the sovereign God. He's actively involved. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all unto the glory of God. See his invisible hand in everything. And that should encourage us. Last night we had four of our grandchildren over. And one of them, a Cameron, he loves to get in the little electric car. And I said to him, do you guys want to go night riding? And he says, yeah, night riding, night riding, Papa. So I put the little headlights on the front of their heads. You couldn't see the car. All you could see is the two little headlights. And Cameron is, he's, he's an evil Knievel. He is a daredevil and a half. 
So he starts at the top of the hill and he floors it. And he's coming down the hill and I positioned myself at the bottom of the hill. I was going to get run over, but at least I would buffer uh, going into the ditch. He's coming down there and all I can see is these two little headlights. And they're coming down there. And I'm like, 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 Cameron! And he all of a sudden takes his foot off the gas and turns the wheel and that thing just goes and comes to a stop and I'm standing right there. And Michael, his brother, he wasn't driving. He jumps out and he grabs my hand and he goes, Papa, I'm afraid. <laughs> and then he said, Papa, are you ever afraid? And I said, Michael, I couldn't hardly see his face. All I could see was two little lights <laughs> looking at me. I said, yes, Papa gets afraid. And as Cameron was going back the hill to do it all over again, he asked me another question, and I wished I could remember because I would tell you, but I can't. And I looked at him, and I got down in his face, and I said, Michael, that's why Jesus came. And it was that redemptive moment of just pointing, even in the midst of a, a life and living circumstance, and seeing the sovereign hand of God and making the most of the opportunities he gives us, just of everyday life. I wanted to read... Um, this from Chuck Swindoll, because it kind of does the same thing here. He starts at the beginning. He said, Ruth begins with loss and ends with gain. Ruth begins with sorrow and ends with joy. Ruth begins with death and ends not only with life, but with a son, Obed, who ultimately is to have a grandson, David, Israel's greatest king. You will discover in life that all things do work together for the good of those who love God. A blinding loss, a broken romance, an early disease that takes your spouses, the loneliness that follows, disillusionment, maybe some loss of health. These are in no way, listen, the end of your story. By and by, your life will begin to dovetail into a new plan that you could never have imagined. These are difficult times, challenging and changing for so many, and so deeply difficult. For some amongst us here today that I'm so glad are with us, or for Nina as she travels in the air. But... This is such an abiding truth for us. Just a second thing I wanted to mention here. As a new creation in Christ who realizes God is sovereign and in control, by grace through faith, present yourself to God as a living sacrifice, confident, courageous, uh, compassionate. Submit yourself to Him. Yield yourself to Him. In the book of Romans, these incredible thoughts of justification, our identification with Christ in Romans 6 and all that, it leads up to yieldedness in Romans 6. And it leads up to Romans 12, Sheik, that you have proclaimed so powerfully to us. Just present yourself to God. In the light of you being a justified new creation in the light of understanding who He is, just present yourself to Him a living sacrifice, which is your e reasonable act of worship. Beloved ones, it's a choice. It's a choice we make as new creations in Christ. He's not speaking to non-believers there. He is speaking to us. And we make a conscious choice, just like Isaiah, to say, yes, Lord. Take my life. Let it be. That's what I did on February 6, 1983. 
I've lived my life long enough my own way. And I just said, Lord, just take my life and do what you want with it. And I really see that as a major defining moment in my life of doing exactly what I'm saying to you. I have to go back and renew that. <laughs> it seems like daily, but it is what is in my heart. Tony Evans says, by submitting yourself to the Lord's agenda, you open yourself to his sovereign purposes, not only for your own benefit. See, this is all from Ruth, but potentially for the benefit of generations after you. Aren't you glad that Boaz submitted to the will of God? Aren't you glad that Ruth submitted to the will of God? Aren't you glad that all those following, that God was working and willing in this um, ancestry of Michael Loring Kenley? What was interesting was it flows all the way through to where then it comes up to where it says, I married Pam, Alfred. And we had children, Matthew, Joshua, Anna, Joseph, and Benjamin. That's where it ended in 2004. But it hasn't ended now, has it? There's a lot more. There's a Cameron. There's a Michael. There's Wise. The ancestry is, is still being written. And I have an opportunity to impact those generations coming behind me. A third thing, just real quick, I want you to see here. We talked about it when we did the book of Romans. I want you to see here that, that people matter to God. Uh, there could have just, all this could have been left out. There could have been other things that could have been done. But relationships matter. Your family matters. Those who have gone ahead of you. And for us here, those who are going to go behind us and who we really do have an opportunity to, to influence and impact. Our roles are important as moms and dads and brothers and sisters and uncles and, and aunts and grandparents and dearest ones. The generations to come are crucial. That's who we're passing the baton on to. Matt, for you and Grace, you're, 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 you're close there to your dad. But then going on down, Andrea to Abby and to Jacob, coming back to mom and dad, you see, investing in them is crucial for us right now. And as I said last week, there's no better investment than in Michael and Cameron and in my grandchildren. And in my children, Obed, he invested in Jesse. Jesse invested in David. And David became the great king of Israel. If you go away with anything today, go away with this. Jesus died, not for a program. Jesus died for people. He died for you. He died for me. And people matter to him. And they should so matter to us. And that leads us to the final uh, thought that I really made, I hope, each week for us is the really, the spiritual prefiguring and fulfilling in this grand and glorious little book. Four little chapters. But they point to, they prefigure Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer, and so much that fills in uh, from there. Some have said this is a, be a beautiful revelation of the relationship between Boaz and Ruth and it carrying on to the point that it pictures a type of Christ and his bride, the church. And the ultimate end of this genealogy is uh, Jesus Christ. 
Matthew 1.1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, where we started today, the son of Abraham. And in verse 3 it says, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begat Ram. Ram begot Amenadab and Amenadab begot Nashon and Nashon begat Salmon. And Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth and Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David, the son of the king passage we looked at was important enough to be put into Matthew. But then the ending is what really matters. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. That's our exclamation point. And one thing that Jeek uh, that mentioned to me that I wanted to mention here really was kind of impressed upon me. He had heard someone share about this incredible book. And so they had really sort of symbolically looked at it that, that Naomi really is symbolic of, of Israel, Ruth of the church and the Gentiles, and Boaz, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, our kinsman, Redeemer, and and Jesus Christ is in this awesome and incredible line and how blessed we are to spiritually be in that line by grace through faith in our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Father, we are so grateful today for the opportunity to be able to come together to worship in spirit and truth, to exalt Jesus, and to say that as great as King David was, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And anew and afresh, we see your hand working and willing and doing in our world, meaning everything to work together for good for those of us who love you because you first loved us. We anew and afresh sur submit and surrender ourselves to you. And we would purpose that Jesus Christ through us would bear the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, so that others would see him, the hope that dwells within us, and that God, our Heavenly Father, would receive all the glory, now and forevermore, and to all future generations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want us to do something right before we do uh, take communion, which we will do in just a second. If you don't have a cup and you're going to plan on taking communion with us, you can go. What we're going to do is two things. One of the things I have learned from Rachel Seaman is, and from Charles, and George does it as well, and does uh, those explanations of some of the hymns, sometimes it's really important to understand what is behind the writer's thought. So we are going to, before we partake of communion, we are going to have a man named Michael Weave who wrote a song, which is perfect for today, called Redeemed. And for us to be redeemed, we had to have a redeemer, right? <laughs> kind of goes hand in hand. So as I listened to this this week, I thought this was just perfect, that uh, there was a people who needed a redeemer. And Jesus said, here I am. And so, if you would, we'll play the story behind the hymn, I mean behind the spiritual song, and then we'll play that. And then I'll invite us to partake together, okay? So if you would, Jason. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Amen. I am redeemed. Can you say that with me? I am redeemed. And that opens this incredible invitation for us to celebrate the Redeemer, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Paul wrote these incredible words in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is our Savior and our Redeemer. He came for people. He gave himself for people. And he is coming again at the rapture to establish a kingdom and us with him. Well, let's pray together. Eternal and everlasting Father, today we celebrate our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came and gave himself for us to redemptively ransom us from sin. And we celebrate him today. But he came to not only give himself for us, but to give himself to us, to live within us and through us, so that we would bring glory to God as living sacrifices in all that we do. So today we come as the redeemed to partake of this memorial celebration to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, to express in a physical way that we are redeemed. We believe that he is Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ, and that he has given himself for us and that he is our redeemer and we are redeemed by grace through faith in him. So thank you, Lord Jesus for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for continuing to be that ink in the pen that is still writing our story for your glory. And we pray these things in the name of our kinsman redeemer, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. May he receive the glory now and forevermore. Amen. Well, if you can navigate the opening of this and uh, I heard some of them while I was preparing don't take off the uh, drink part first or you'll never get the wafer does everybody get in is everybody in does everybody have one does anybody need to make your way back and get get one yes I will will be happy to wait because I'm so grateful that you're here And I'm so grateful that even though the world would want to turn us away from a lot of things, we can celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ today together. And we can celebrate by partaking together. Uh, From the first time I got here in 1988, uh, Paulie, I remember the first time that uh, Bill had said, I'm going to be out of town. And... uh, my eyes were probably bigger than saucers, and I thought, oh, no. And he said, why don't you do communion? And I did communion, and ever since, it's always held such a special place in my heart. So this is a special day for me, and maybe the last time we'll do this together in 2020. Maybe the last time forever if he comes back, right? <laughs> I'm, that's what I'm looking forward to, <laughs> so I don't know about you guys. Maybe he's going to finish writing our story sooner than we think. But So Jesus took bread on that night. He broke it. He blessed it, and he broke it. And he said that this is my body, which is given for you. Um, do this in remembrance of me. So, so let's eat together in the remembrance of our Redeemer. And then I want to ask you, if you would, in his honor, the honor of Jesus Christ, to stand with me as we would partake together of the cup. Jesus said that the cup was the new covenant that was in his blood. And I've always loved the thought, and you know I've mentioned it most every time we've partaken together, that the Old Testament said that the life was in the blood. So as we partake today of this cup, I would ask that we be in remembrance of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for us to set us free 
but also be in remembrance that as we uh, put this in our bodies, he is in our bodies spiritually. He is living within us. And as we have focused on hope, we drink in the name of Jesus, who truly is our hope of glory. So let's drink together. And would you just proclaim with me, I am redeemed. And we proclaim our Redeemer, and blessed be our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Everyone, we're dismissed. Have a wonderful week. And I love you guys, and thank you for being here. Mm -hmm.